published, right? The, the one we did about a week ago, which is purely focused on uh, just, just the bylaw consultation. This is a, a, a replay of the actual full town hall presentation, so it's a little bit longer. Uh, I'll still try to keep it brief because I know you got things to do. Uh, we, as you know, we're, we're traveling the province. We're getting uh, eight different dates over about a three to four week period. And uh, we basically went down the list of the most populous areas as far as RTs go and uh, picked the top eight. So it wasn't meant to exclude anybody, but obviously we can't be everywhere. So that's how we did it. So this is in place of that. And so thanks. So away we go. Uh, let's start by uh, just telling you a little bit about who the college is and what they do. Uh, many of you will know this, but in case you don't, uh, we're going to start high, high level. Uh, Canada Health Act. Basically, federal statute lays out health care as a, well, a right. It's a right of citizens in Canada. And then it's up to the provinces to administer that. So what that means is that each province has to determine the best way to provide health care for the people in that province. And one of the ways to do that, I and mean, all healthcare is regulated, but uh, in order to be able to have specific prep professions manage how they're structured, what their standards are, they created something called self-regulation. And self-regulation really exists only a handful of countries now. Uh, and Ontario is probably the purest form that still exists. Basically, what it means is that those professions that have such specialized knowledge that an external party would have difficulty managing practice for that profession, that profession is granted self-regulation status. And so there are 26 self-regulated health colleges and a number of non-health colleges in Ontario, and respiratory therapy is one of them. So that's why we exist. Now, when you think back to what the province's responsibility is, the province has to ensure that there's an adequate quality of care that's provided to the people that live in their province. So that means that this ability has been uh, provided or delegated to respiratory therapists but the, and through the college, but the college is accountable for what we do. We have to be able to ensure that standards are met, that the quality is adequate, and that government's happy with that. That's them exercising the responsibility through us. So that means that as we do what we do, we really only have um, a handful of functions. They're all laid out in, in statute, in legislation. And we basically do five things. Number one, set standards of practice for the profession. So that's the requirements that you need to be able to become a respiratory therapist. Two, for the people that meet those standards, then you're eligible to become registered and you're a member of the college. Three, uh, to set the standards of practice and ongoing practice guidelines. Four, to ensure that there's some ongoing professional development. And if you think about that, that's, it, it, it would be obvious that basically, if, from the eyes of the public, if you had a family doc that hadn't read a single journal, updated their knowledge since they graduated 40 years ago, that'd be bad. Uh, so this, there's an expectation that everybody who's in a self-regulated college is continuing to grow and stay on top of um, developments in their own profession. That's what that's all about, this, this fourth function. And the fifth is sort of the bad cop side of things. That's the, if there are concerns about uh, members of the profession, if there are concerns about people falling below those standards, there needs to be an avenue to raise those concerns and then address them. And that's what that whole ICR discipline fitness to practice stream is about. So those are the only things that we really do as a college. There's no advocacy work, nothing at all. And that means that we really only have one lens, and that's the lens of interest. That's, that's all that we do. And ensuring that we maintain that public confidence is absolutely paramount. Um, there's been so much press uh, over the last year, maybe even two, uh, suggesting that perhaps, let's say, the CPSO is a bit of an old boys club and that they're protecting doctors. Nothing could be further from the truth. But it's important that the public doesn't start to think that because then they lose confidence in what you do as a regulator. And then, of course, that reflects back to the government and their ability to be able to ensure quality of care and so on. So that's why we say public confidence is number one. And we work very hard to maintain that trust. Now, how is this college built? It's structured. Uh, there's a council, which is more or less the equivalent of a board of directors. There are 17 people on it, so it's a big group. And just more than half, so nine of them, are elected. So elected res representatives or elected RTs uh, from across the province. Of course, we have seven uh, jurisdictions where we have people elected from. And then the remainder, the other half, um, is uh, appointed by the left-hand governor of, Canada, of Ontario. So it means that you've got this balance of profession viewpoints and public viewpoints. And that balance is really important because you could just imagine, put a bunch of RTs in the room together and talk about a, a clinical issue. It's going to get very RT issue very fast. So having that balance of the public perspective, and our public members are great. I mean, they're retired principals, they're lawyers, they're, they're researchers. 
um, people have a background in medical sales, and a really diverse group. They're able to kind of pull things back and make sure that balance stays there. Now, those 17 people carry out those five main functions of the college through a variety of, of um, committees, and that's those ones on the right-hand side of your screen. And so each of those are populated, but there's so many more people. So we have what are called non-council committee members, it's additional RTs that are elected by you to sit on those committees. So that's that's how we're structured, and that's how the work is done. Here's our, our, uh, our complement of staff. We have 10 staff. Apologies, Ryan is our newest newest addition, and he's he really is a smiley face, but he's he's better looking than that. So we'll get his picture up there soon. But those are those are the scary faces of everybody working at the college. And that's right off of our website. So if you're trying to access us, you can put a face to the name and and the contact information for everybody is just below that. And the next two slides, they're really just there for information to let you know that we have them. Um, like any other organization, of course, we have a strategic plan. Uh, the strategic plan lays out our priorities of priorities of the college for the, the next handful of years. And this document uh, really identifies the foundations, some of the external uh, uh, factors, external events that are happening, and trends that influence the development of the current strategic priorities. So though, again, those are on the website. Feel free to look them up. And you'll also find this document, which are the current strategic priorities. The, the five columns there are our five areas of focus. And then there are a number of activities that fall under each one of those. So again, I'd encourage you to, if you're curious, want to know what we're working on, Take a look at that, find that on the website, and uh, that'll tell you where we're going. Now, some of the um, some of the more recent initiatives are things that we've done in the last handful of years. For one, we um, dramatically diversified our communications approach. So you'll you'll remember the first ten years of the college, we didn't really get along that well with the profession. So when uh, we figured well, when I when I started, we we start, launched two surveys. Uh, one was basically a "Do you still hate us?" survey, and uh, the second was uh, "How how would you like us to communicate with you?" So we were delighted with the results. We're actually doing much better. We've left the dark days behind us, and, and we're in a better place. But what we heard from the communication survey was, "Yeah, there are, some of the communications are good, but there's ways that you can improve it." So we completely diversified our, our communications approach. First, we made sure that the website was updated. It's the main repository of information. It should be your go-to place for anything related to the college. That's how we view it. That's how we structure it. That's how we set it up. So that's that's your, your primary interface. The second thing is, of course, we've always had an e-bulletin. Continue to mail that out. But we, we, we look at the stats every month. We look at to see what was popular, what were people reading, uh, you know, how many how many hits we get. Was, and then we analyze it. And was the language accessible? Um, and we look to see what people are interested in. We structure all of our content in an editorial process. So we try to make, again, that document or that release as relevant and as current as possible. We diversified into uh, social media. So we've got a Twitter account, and I think we have three. I'm looking over to Janice. I think we have just under 400 followers now. So that's 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 great. That's that's really good. Uh, Carol puts out a practice blog, and it's fantastic. If you haven't read it, go read it. Uh, it's basically whatever is current and happening that month right on top of it, and it goes into the blog. We tried to make the language in all of our communications, whether it's official letters or just, you know, update uh, emails, less legal ease. You know, you should be able to read it and understand what it's saying without your eyes glazing over. So, uh, I'm sure you've seen an improvement in that. We updated our logo, and of course, and of course, on the right there, our wonderful app. So we launched the app, and I'm going to come back to that when we talk about the QA program. We also tried to go as digital as possible, you'll notice that uh, you're on, you can now renew online. Uh, initial applications are coming soon for online renewal uh, or online application. And um, we've basically been able to eliminate just about every piece of paper that we use in the office. Uh, with you know, that's great benefits, it means we don't have to print anything, we don't have to produce all of the paper, we don't have to print, and costs have been reduced appropriately. Again, we're going to talk about that. So some of the things that you don't likely see, unless you really pay attention to what we're up to, uh, I'll just point out six, six key initiatives that have happened in the last couple of years. We just, just today, uh, released version of what's called the National Framework, the profile. And that's a document that lays out which competencies are required for entry to practice. The document had 180. It's been completely revamped. It's a brand new approach. I think there are about 80 in the new document, but it's much more robust. It's the best competency document that we've produced to date. 
And it was, we're traveling, you know, presenting at two different conferences. We just presented on the weekend to an assessment conference. And people were very interested in this. So it looks like we've actually got a really good document on our hands. So we're very proud of that. Uh, so you can find that on our website. Go check it out. All of the curricula in all of the 24 programs across Canada will be built off that starting in 2017. So that's a very forward-looking document. And that's what's going to be um, comprising the backbone of the competencies for all RTs entering the profession as of 2020. We are in the process of updating our standards of practice document because it's sorely out of date. And we're doing this jointly with uh, the regulator in Saskatchewan, which is excellent because it means that we're going to have very similar standards in at least two different provinces in the country, which is important from a labor mobility perspective. Uh, Carol's been right on top of the medical assistance and dying topic. There's not a whole lot that's really going to change for RTs, but continue to, to, to watch as this rolls out. Of course, the legislation is done, and now they just have to have to work through st uh, stakeholder groups to, to finalize things over the next year. But uh, if there are any changes, uh, again, we've got it all on our website to help keep you abreast of the talk itself. In that middle, that middle honeycomb there, um, we, it, it, internationally educated health professionals, we get in the range of about 20 international applicants annually. And uh, uh, respiratory therapy, as you know, across the globe varies. So it means that we could get uh, applicants from countries where the profession resembles what ours was 30 years ago. We could get applicants that trained in a different profession, like nurse anesthetists from North Africa, um, uh, AAs from Tunisia, internationally trained medical grads as well. So we needed to have an assessment process that allowed us to appropriately appraise the background and education and training of the individuals that are applying to us. And so in the last two years, we have built, developed, piloted, and launched uh, a brand new assessment process, which truly is best of breed. We're very proud of it. Uh, the results are uh, good, defensible, and again, we presented on this to, to, good, to good feedback. Two last things there. Uh, we have just finished uh, revisions to our ethics and um, prevention, uh, infection prevention and control documents and so you'll find those available on the website shortly yeah we're just going through translations so they'll be out there soon and the last is the changes to the assistive devices program so this is this is kind of a big deal we've been working on this for about nine years i want to say um essentially for uh, uh, for oxygen delivery in the community 95 percent of it or even greater is paid for through the assistive devices program and uh, what we were seeking to do was have RTs added as authorizers uh, on the home oxygen forms, actually sign and allow the oxygen to be delivered to the patients. And, and this previously wasn't the case. So this was an access to care issue as far as we were concerned. So an advocacy for the profession, it was an access issue. So we worked with ADP and have changed a number of things, everything from introducing the Fifth Control Act, which was the administration of oxygen, we had to develop uh, standards for the administration of oxygen. So if you're wondering, why is the college producing standards on the delivery of oxygen? That was why. We needed to do it for the ADP program. Uh, we beefed up our conflict of interest provisions so that there were no concerns about the people that were selling the oxygen, also signing for the oxygen. And uh, at the end of this, we were able to get the policy changed and uh, our RTs can now sign for HOMO2, which is, um, which is a good development. So that's, that's, uh, there's been a lot going on in the last couple of years. So one of the two big ticket things that I wanted to talk about today was QA program reform. So the current QA program, remember the old one didn't go so well. So the current QA program was launched in 2004, and roughly every four years we've done a review of it. We're starting to hear some consistent trends that made us realize that we needed a, a fresh approach to how the QA program was built and structured. So, as of 2017, we're going to be launching our new professional development program. And here are some of the details on that. The new program is essentially going to consist of these four elements. The backbone is still going to be the online portfolio that you all have, and some of you have accessed. Uh, you'll notice that in that portfolio, it's changed. Visually, it's changed. We've integrated GROW, so that's a professional development framework. GROW is now part portfolio. So when you enter any learning activity, you get to assign which of the GROW domains that it fits best under, and you'll notice that your GROW wheel shapes in response to the entries that you put in there. So it's completely customizable. So it allows you to really self-assess your own learning, which is kind of good. Uh, starting in the new program, you'll be happy about this, no more random selection. 
you're going to be on a schedule. So essentially, there's a standard. You submit your portfolio on your schedule date. You're either at standard or below. If you're at standard, you're good for five more years. If you're below standard, you're going to meet with a peer advisor to be able to help coach you through it, give you tips on how to improve, and we talk again in a year, always with the goal of getting you off to standard, and then you get a five-year five -year period, and then we'll look again five years. So this, this is because we all know people that have been selected three, four times, and we know people that haven't been selected at all. So that's been a huge dissatisfier. So we thought it was a different approach. So there'll be more to come on that, but you know, the takeaway is no more random selection. And the last, last thing is that uh, the jurisprudence exam, you know, any of you that have been selected, you remember that you've been writing the professional standards assessment, the 60-ish question uh, evaluation open book exam, gone. You'll no longer have to do that as part of your review time. Uh, instead, what we're going to do is we're going to introduce uh, an e-learning module. Basically, every year, if there's anything that you missed, if you read our stuff, maybe you caught everything. If you don't read our stuff, you should read our stuff. This is good stuff. But if you don't, then you might have missed if there's regulation changes, practice standard upgrades, uh, any important news. That all goes in an e-learning module that everyone will complete annually. It'll take 20 minutes or so. And the goal is completion. It's not a pass-fail. It's just work your way through it. Make sure that you're informed and then on you go. So that should be a better way to keep people informed than having to go through a very large exam. And two other things that are really part of the program but don't, don't affect every RT, uh, well, the, the portability app, of course, we talked about a little bit earlier. Part of the challenge I know for everybody is, um, I think this is like the shoebox full of tax receipts at tax time. If you're ever asked to submit your portfolio, you've probably got a drawer full of certificates and little scraps of paper where you wrote down um, what you've gone to, box and things you read and whatnot. Um, to have to recreate all of that or dig through is a bit of a pain. So the reason why we launched the app is it means that now, at the point of learning, you can enter the, the learning activity right there. So if you're at a talk, if you're at a conference, if you're at one of our town hall sessions, you can snap a picture. Uh, Paul Williams, when I was down in London, took a selfie with me in the background to prove that he was actually there. So that's the type of thing that you can do with the app that just makes it so much easier for you to maintain your own portfolio. The second thing is that for every new person that becomes registered with the college, so that's students, it's people that come in from out of province, that old PSA exam has been repurposed. And now it's really a, a jurisprudence exam that every new person writes to ensure that everyone's familiar with the, the, well, the, the rules and the standards that guide their practice. So that's the new QA program. There's, uh, there's lots more information on our website. One of the current sliders is a little whiteboard video about all the changes. So for more information, go there and stay tuned, and we'll be rolling that over the next year. You may also remember that last fall, fall seems to be the time for bylaw consultations. Last fall, we were doing a consultation on changes related to transparency. and. Uh, just in a, in a nutshell, there was, there was an imperative from the Minister of Health that was, it was basically a call to action. It was a call to all regulators to increase the degree of transparency um, that existed with the information that they, is available for the public. And so this is very much along with the open government approach that, that this current government is taking. And it, it's hard to argue against the principle. I mean, the idea is that the healthcare consumer is, is much more aware and wishes to be much more informed of the choices that they have in healthcare. And so being able to find out information about the people that are providing care to you so that you can make good choices kind of makes sense. So every, every college in Ontario collaborated on, on developing some standards and some guidelines that we could all agree to. And uh, those were the changes that we made. So those, those changes were largely seen on the register that we have. So you know, if you go online and you can look up uh, every RT. We added additional information. So if there's anybody with a criminal conviction, if there are bail conditions, basically if, if uh, let's say, if somebody was going to be coming into your home and they had a long history associated with crime or substance abuse, you might want to, uh, and this is you know, criminal activity related to, to substances, you might want to know that before they come into your home. So this is the intent of having that information available on the website. So that's, that was last year, and I thought it would just be good to just recap and, and speak specifically to that in case you wondered what was going on. And so now, 
as for our current bylaw changes. So of course, uh, all of the content that's in there, for bylaws, we circulate it to all of the stakeholders, RTs being the number one stakeholder. We, we send it to other colleges, we send it to government, we send it to other um, uh, RT regulators across the country, all for feedback. And there are oh, probably over 30 different, really doing housekeeping. Uh, the vast majority of them, they're, they really are housekeeping. It's things like, as we put up there, we didn't have a definition of quorum. You'd be amazed how many people argue over what constitutes quorum. Is it 50% plus one? Is it greater than half? What is it? Define that. Um, we added a picture of the seal. There was a requirement for a safety deposit box. You know, if you wonder what that is, back in 1994 when these were first drafted, the, re the requirement for us to keep all of our financial instruments in a safety deposit box might have made sense. 20 some odd years later, in a digital age, nobody has their invest paper anymore. It's all electronic. So to have a safety deposit box just doesn't make any sense. But it's in our bylaws as a requirement. So in order for us to get rid of the safety deposit box, we have to change the bylaw. So that's what the vast majority of them are. But there are a few that I wanted to just take a bit of time and focus in on. Any that had uh, anything related to do with uh, governance or oversight, I figured it we should probably explain. So for one, we're pro proposing to actually remove this one. Uh, there was a requirement that all internal checks had to be signed by an external signing officer. Um, so the reason why we want to get rid of that, if you think about the principle behind it, the idea is that you know, all of the checks that we have internally have to be signed by two people anyway. The thinking is an external person, if those two people were signing them and maybe signing the check to themselves, uh, that external person would be able to ca catch that and pick up on it uh, and stop it. Assuming, of course, that the two people that were siphoning the money themselves didn't pick an external person that was maybe going to get cut. And there were ways around it. So we actually wanted to have better financial controls. So all of our checks are reviewed annually as part of our financial audit. It's done by an external body, it's an accounting firm. They are completely arm's length from us. They're separate from management and they report directly to the board. So if there are any concerns about how the management staff, how the college conducts itself with respect to the checks, they'll pick up on it and they feed it back to council, which is a much better financial control than this would suggest. So we're going to strike it. The second thing is we're really trying to improve the governance of all of our, all of our functions. But in the, there are three different committees we mentioned committees earlier. There are three that have panels. It's a QA committee and the investigations coins and, and uh, reports committee. So in each of those, in terms of rounds, what we've done is to ensure that we've got that balanced view in the terms, we've added a requirement to have a public member on those panels uh, so it doesn't get too RT-ish. We just reinforce that through our bylaws to make sure that it's stronger than it would be if it was just in the terms of reference. Well, that's, that's what that's all about. It allows for better, better decision making. We needed to clarify who is active. So the term active doesn't actually mean anything from a regulatory perspective. So what we needed to do when this was saying you needed to hold an active certificate, it really was an, an empty term. So we've, we've clarified that by uh, adding a language to state that if you're going to vote or if you're going to run, uh, you need to be a general or a limited certificate of practice. Can't be an active because you're an active, so you actually don't get to vote. And if you're a graduate, it's not a full membership, so grads aren't eligible, eligible to vote in elections either. This one I definitely wanted to speak to because I could imagine how many people's eyes would pop and say, what is this $5,000 assessment? So this is what it's all about. This relates to our international applicants. Essentially, anyone that has been out of practice for a prolonged period of time seeking reinstatement or trained uh, outside of a recognized uh, educational program it needs to go through some sort of assessment process so that we can determine how does their background compare to the Canadian requirements, or Ontario requirements. So uh, there are three elements, three elements in our assessment. One is a paper review, which consists of going through a person's educational credentials, their work experience, resume, and so on. That's, that's fine as a paper review, but then you have to actually start talking to people to understand what their background is. So we do a structured interview as a second step, and that's with two individuals that are properly trained to conduct a, the type of interview that we do. And that's you ask people questions about their background. Say, tell me about a time that you did X. 
again, that's a good second step, but what we really needed to have was some demonstration element. So the third component in the assessment are 10 small stations, it's a combination of OSCEs and, and immersive clinical sim, where the applicant actually goes through some scenarios and practices intubating and putting in uh, art lines and art punctures and so on. And so you can actually see if people have the competencies that the standards require. So that's a little bit more expensive. So uh, capping the number here at $5,000 does one of two, well, it does two things for us. One, it's completely transparent. So the applicant knows roughly how much money that they need to budget to plan for moving ahead through this assessment. It may mean that they need to put it off for a little while, but it needs to be transparent. The second thing is for us, it means that we can cap it at an amount that ensures that we're able to conduct this on a cost recovery basis. Uh, they're not members of the college, so this isn't a cost that really should be borne by the college of the membership. It needs to be cost recovery. Uh, and so that capping out of that just allows us to do it. So that's what that's all about. And now the one you really are waiting for. Here we go. Yeah, sorry everybody. We're going we're gonna to have to raise the fees. So beginning in 2018, we're proposing to raise the registration fee for the general graduate limits, limited certificates to $620, and then the NACT will go up as well to, to $100. And so now we're going to take 10 minutes or so and really go through the rationale why. So, you know, in a nutshell, so we've had a 22-year run with no fee increase. Like we've never had a fee increase, not since the fee was first set in Um which is spectacular. We're the only college to ever do that. But the concern, of course, is that although our fees haven't risen, the costs have risen. So, you know, I put on the slide there, if you use a, an inflation calculator, what cost $500 in 1994 costs $780 today. So we've been doing our best to manage costs, but as of 2017, we're in, we're in a deficit scenario. The, the costs have risen to the price of inflation to such an extent that we can't keep ahead of it with the current registration fee. So why didn't we do it earlier? Well, there are a couple of reasons. Uh, for one, you know, we squeezed just about every dollar out of this budget. We reduced costs pretty much where, any, anywhere that we could, and, and I hope you can see this slide. Some of the things that we tracked, we, we basically took all of our expenses uh, charted them over the last decade and look to see trends. Um, things like the telephone, fax, costs, you know, we renegotiate those with the as low as we can go. The, uh, the, when we were talking about the green strategy, well, part of the green strategy was actually just to reduce costs. So we hardly print anything. In fact, the only thing that we routinely print for the whole membership is the annual renewal notice, and that's just because sending that in the mail is considered a more or less a legal standard. Uh, the only things that we've seen a bump in were translation costs, and that's because we're committed to ensuring that uh, you know, as many as are available in both official languages. So we had some backlog that we tried to address this last year. And uh, the, with online processes, if you're using credit cards, well, the banks charge you a merchant fee for the, the privilege of using a credit card. So to try to minimize, minimize even costs related to that, and we, you know, there's, there's not a whole lot of room, as you can imagine, to to negotiate with the banks on, on those things. But what we do is we check to see the usage of different bank cards. So for example, uh, HSBC is not one of the cards that we uh, accept, or not one of the banks that we accept cards from, and that's because they charge you, I think it's about $15,000 just to be able to use the card, regardless of whether anybody does use the card. So when we looked, we only had four people that were, were banking with HSBC that were renewing, and so we made the decision to drop it. So that's how we're able to try to minimize the cost, but it's still it's something that we have very little control over. So we've, we've minimized as many operational costs as possible, and, uh, and we continue to stay on top of that. But that's how we've been able to push this out to 22 years. The second thing is that one of the, one of the, one of the things that we could absolutely count on year over year was a growth in the membership of anywhere from 100 to 120 people annually. So there are 150 students that graduate approximately every, pro every year in the province. Um, some move out of province. Some people retire. Um, some people move into the province. So we have a net increase of that 100 to 120, which at 500 bucks a pop is 50 to $60,000 growth annually. So this has allowed us to extend it. As long as we kept our funding more or our spending more or less contained, it get extravagant in what we did and minimize costs, that plus steady growth in membership meant that 
we could stay status quo. But again, as of 2017, that's not going to work for us. If you think about it, as your principal grows, you know, 3% of a larger number is going to be a larger number. And that's where, uh, as of 2017, we're actually going to outpace that predicted growth. So that's why we're in a bit of a crunch. So I tried to address some of the questions uh, that have been coming up both through emails, and thank you for those of you that have been sending emails. Uh, we've been monitoring the, the, the comments that go into the, the survey uh, for uh, the fee increase as well, uh, and that's very helpful, and even from the town hall. So some of the other questions that are coming up for us, are, why so much? It's a 24% increase. Uh, essentially, what we there are two ways that we could have gone about it. It was one, uh, one increase and then try to not increase fees again for a period or it's go to an annual increase to try to just offset that cost of inflation. The challenge with the cost of inflation or an annual increase is it's really hard to budget because of the type of, type of business we're in and the types of variable costs. I'm going to show you the, the biggest one in a moment. And we felt that since it's been so long, there's, well, there's never been an increase since it's been so long since there was, well, never. Um, for <laughs> increase, felt that it was going to be more palatable for everyone to not have to go through it again. It's really stable. So we, again, we have a pretty good handle on what our expenses are. So we're predicting that we won't have to increase it for five to seven years. So that's that's why the number was picked, and that's why that was the horizon that we were looking for. Also wanted to ensure that it was just enough to, like, like I was saying earlier, we have a pretty good handle on costs. We've minimized pretty much everywhere we can. So there are only two or three areas that have variable costs. And uh, so I, we're pretty confident in this prediction. Yes, there are no promises, but that's what we're targeting. We're, we're hoping no further increase for five to seven years. Now, what is costing more? You know, the biggest variable cost is investigations and hearings. You know, historically, we get in the range of 11 to 12 cases annually. Um, the last couple of years, we've seen a spike in that, and it seems to be a trend across all colleges. You know, we talk to each other. Everybody's seen an increase. And not just an increase in the number of cases, but the complexity of cases. I mean, there, there are some of the cases that we get. So we're getting cases that are now involving, um, you know, people filing complaints to try to gain a competitive business advantage by tying up a competitor in the complaints process. We're getting um, complaints that uncover years and years and years of history at employers. That just means that the case becomes much, much bigger than expected. And you can see that big spike. Last year, we had our most expensive case, um, which uh, more than tripled the average cost of pursuing an investigation. So this is one of the key things that we exist for. And it's not just RTs um, filing reports. It's, it's actual patients that are, are submitting complaints as well. So I think part of what we're seeing is there's a more aware and activist public. People are actually involved in their own care and taking action where historically they didn't. Right? So in a more informed and active uh, patient population, it translates to greater numbers of cases. So we expect this trend to continue, and uh, we only we only have funding from one source, and that's that's you, the members. So uh, if we end up with a shortfall, then we have to come back to the person, and that's not something that anyone's going to like. So this, this is one of the thing, factors that we considered when we were trying to pick the right number. The second thing is, as the profession becomes more sophisticated, there is a greater degree of activity at a national level. Um, and this is something that, uh, you know, admittedly, most of you don't see. This competency framework, for example, uh, is, is an, an excellent document. That was a better part of two years of work, and so that's that's lots of that's lots of travel. It's consultants to be able to do this, and every regulator in Canada contributes to it. But it's a bigger, more complicated document because there are more people involved. There's more jurisdictions. You know, in the last ten years, we've gone from four regulated jurisdictions to eight, so that the you know the number of regulated professionals in Canada has, has essentially doubled. Closely related to that are all of the associated activities to a competency framework. So the accrediting body, we've been working with the accrediting body to uh, align with some of the requirements that we're being uh, placed, placed under. So increased transparency, for example, uh, is something that we need to see from everybody that we do business with. And so we've been working with Coarty to be able to, to move forward on aligning their practices with the requirements of regulatory bodies. Uh, in addition, with this new competency framework, it's going to mean that there's going to be, have to be different tools and different processes to be able to accredit, different way than it's been done in the past. 
And so that's going to be additional work. The CBRC, as many of you know, have gone to computer-based testing, which is excellent. It opens up so many possibilities for a better exam, but that also means working more closely with them to ensure that it meets the requirements of a regulatory body. And the last thing is uh, we do have a status of, of labor mobility across the country. Basically, there's legislation that means that if you're registered in any one jurisdiction, you can be automatically eligible to be registered with the same certificate in any other re regulated jurisdiction in Canada. So that's... That, that's a good thing in terms of, of portability of, of licensure. It does mean that you have to work together to ensure that the entry standards are the same. Otherwise, you end up with a weak link or a back door for people to be able to get into the country and then work you know, as a place of choice. And so to close those back doors, that's a little bit of extra work. And so that's we've been heavily involved in that. And the last thing is just, just the cost of doing business. You know, we, we had to update the, the, the standards because there's, they're, they're sorely out of date. The ethics and, and infection prevention control documents had to be updated. Uh, the QA program, it's a, a little bit of work to be able to revise that. I, and then there are things that you just can't plan for. So our 2014's transparency requirements, uh, that was again, was two years of work. The sexual abuse task force, uh, which was struck by the, the Ministry of Health uh, 18 months ago, just released its report. And that's, so that's resulting in significant changes to how sexual abuse cases are handled in Ontario, and the Ministry of Health has just started its consultation on that. So I think that that's going to be a big chunk of budgets in Ontario over the next two years. So the, again, these are just the things that sometimes you can plan for and sometimes you just can't. And so when we try to pick how we're going to do a fee increase, having a window or having an amount that we can work within, it, that's a lot it's a lot better, a lot better of a solution for us than trying to just increase by the cost of living on an annual basis. So two other questions that we get quite frequently. One is, can we move out of Toronto? And, and you know, I think it's a fair question, but honestly, no. I mean, this is the administrative center of, of healthcare in the province. Um, we're just down the street, Mark. We do a fair amount of interaction with the government. Um, we do certainly uh, interact with every other health college in Ontario. College in Ontario. And there are other organizations that we're accountable to and we're closely with. So the Office of the Fairness Commissioner, for example, is, is just down the street from here. Obviously, the Privacy Commissioner is, is here as well. And so email is great, but face-to-face -face is absolutely essential for maintaining those relationships and actually getting work done with those. So that's just a reality that we have. So if we have to stay in Toronto, what can we do to try to reduce rent? This last year we've done, regularly we do a comparison, but just relevant to this particular fee increase, we had uh, a rent comparison done. So we pay probably less than any other regulator in Ontario because of where we're situated. We sit in a Class C building, so that means it's not a fancy building. Uh, it's in a building that, that uh, focuses specifically on, on healthcare organizations and not-for-profits. Some of the organizations that you've seen here, the Human Rights Tribunal has offices in this building. Uh, obviously, they're not throwing money around. Sick kids rent space here, and hospitals don't have money to burn, so they're pretty thrifty on where they rent as well. So we're in a good location. Now, just for point of comparison, we shopped around to see what kind of rents we could get anywhere else in the city. In the GTA, you can't beat what we're getting. You know, you discover with the markup, you can't get better than what we're paying. Uh, we looked at Hamilton. Downtown Hamilton ranges, you know, fourteen to seventeen dollars an hour for, for corporate space. We we're in the middle of that range, so. Even moving to Hamilton isn't going to save us any money. So I mean, I, all I can tell you is that we have to be here and we're paying the best rent that we can. So I don't, I don't think there's much that we can do in terms of reducing costs as far as, as rent goes. I get questions about staffing as well. I've got to tell you, you know, when you look at our, our annual report, you can see that our staffing costs are, are just under 50%, which is pretty remarkable for a, a knowledge-based organization. You can look at your, your hospital, and it's usually going to be up around 60 to 70%. Uh, range. When we look at every one of our comparator size colleges, you know, those small, medium colleges, we have at least four staff less than every one of them. So we're, we're a tight, experienced group um, and uh, running on essentially the, the lowest number of staff that we can. We've got, uh, we had done a salary review, again, in preparation for this. I wanted to know how are we stacking up against others? Are we overpaying? Are we underpaying? And as it turns out, we're pretty much on par. So, you know, what can I tell you? We, we've got a, a, a solid core group of staff that are outstanding. Um, because of that, we have fewer staff than 
other comparators, and uh, and we're paying on par, so we're not overpaying. So there's really no wiggle room on staffing. And so how do we compare? I mean, this is I think this is interesting and, and, and important for you when you're when you're um, you know, getting your head around this. Uh, this is all of the the other uh, RTO regulations across the country. Um, going from west to east, you can see that, that Alberta, the church is 425, Saskatchewan just recently raised theirs to 500, um, Manitoba is at, currently at 300, and you know, they're considering raising theirs as well. Uh, we were always the highest, we continue to be the highest with this increase to 620. Quebec is at 400, 450 for New Brunswick, Nova Scotia is at 450, and then uh, Newfoundland is just at 500 as well. So that four to 500 range is pretty much what most people have been at. We're a little bit bigger than them. Just because you're bigger doesn't necessarily mean you get that economy of scale and a big drop, you know, unless you're the College of Nurses and you've got 100,000 members. But for us, it just means that you know, you're, you're a bigger college, you get more complaints, you do different things in the cloud. So it doesn't really change our position there, but at least that will give you a sense of how we compare to other colleges. This is probably more interesting to you. So when we look at the registration fees for all of the colleges in Ontario, so 26 colleges, right? Uh, we removed the big ones. We took nurses out, we took pharmacy out, we took doctors, and we took dentists out. So that leaves your 22. When you look at that range of 22, it ranges from 1,950 for the College of Midwives down to 250 for the College of, of uh, Dental Hygienists. So what we did is we picked our membership number and went plus or minus 1,000 members to try to get those that are closest in comparison to us. And that yields this group here. So it's the College of Speech Language pathologists, it's dietitians, it's RTs, opticians, optometry, and then traditional Chinese medicine. So if you look down the membership numbers, that's that's where you buy we're, we're smack in the middle. And then if you look at the registration fees, so our current fee, the 500, we are by far the lowest. Uh, you should know that opticians is going up to 980. Uh, and uh, our budget is, again, significantly lower than, than everybody else. So although we're in the middle of a size, we're running a tight ship. So with the proposed change, it looks like this. So we're still one of the lowest in comparison to all of our, our like-sized colleges, and our budget is still going to be the lowest in all of our comparators. So again, I mean, this is not supposed to make you happy about it, but it's to help help you gain some perspective and just understand you know, why why we're picking the number that we are and, and uh, how it how it stacks up. So uh, that's that's pretty much what I wanted to cover. So the other thing, the annual registration fee, it's still prorated for the partial year. And so if you join halfway through, then we pay for the remainder of the year. If you resign uh, partway through the year, then you get a refund for the remainder. The, uh, the late fees, the reinstatement fees, they've all been increased proportionately to the increase. The application fee is unchanged at $75. Two last things. So the, the proposal is that it would go up as of March 1st, 2018. So that's 18 months away to give you a little bit of time to prepare for that. And we can do that partly because, remember, we're in a, in a deficit as of 2018, but we do have something called a fee stabilization fund. So this was started, I think Keith Owen gets the, the credit for this at Thunder Bay. Uh, this was started over a decade ago, and uh, it's, it's a buffer. It's something that we can dip into before we have to raise fees. And so we will drain that completely dry before we raise fees, and that's you know, that's what it's there for. So that buys us the time. That's why it's March 2018 is the proposed increase. So I guess I'll stop there, and thanks to everybody that stayed in. That was uh, uh, almost 45 minutes of uh, questions. Uh, you've got uh, you've got the, the the text interface there. Send us a message. Pop up. We can all we can all see it, and I'm happy to respond to anything you have. Stunned silence from the group. Uh, think of this as a ask me anything. So anything other than what we even talked about in um, in the webinar, that's fair game as well. Whatever you want to talk about. And so I would imagine that you are um, 
they're likely to be asking the questions if they know that you're tuning in today. So this, we recorded the event. It's available on, well, on our website in, I'm guessing, about two days. Um, so that'll be up in review and pass forward through and so on. Again, we've got uh, a fairly robust section on our website. So it has all the information that we talked about today. There's an FAQ, which allows you to kind of you know, piece your way through it. Um, many of the slides uh, that we had today are there, so you, you don't have to go full presentation to see them. So we're trying to make this engine as, as rarely available for everyone now as possible. Again, apologies, it's, uh, we, uh, I, I, I've said it I don't know how many times. I, we, know, we know we're not going to make everyone happy, but I, I think this is the first time that we've ever had to raise fees, and so you, know, you as members have, have a right to know why. And so the process is that all of the feedback that we get through the surveys goes back. It's not a done deal yet. Um, it has to go back to the council meeting, uh, which will be uh, just the 1st of December. And that's where council reviews all of the feedback. And, and they know the fiscal realities, the same as you've just heard today. And they'll look at all of the feedback, and they'll be looking to see uh, the only thing that would sway them off of the need for an increase was a, a better alternative. So um, you know, thank you for any feedback. Uh, uh, some of the feedback has been less helpful, uh, but if uh, if you have you know put it all in there. Uh, if you've got ideas, if you've got suggestions, you know, council would welcome any feedback at all. Thanks for, thanks for the comment, Barb. And Faisal, I hope you were able to, uh, I hope you're able to connect in the end. Yeah, and if not, like I, like I said, it'll be it's on, on the website, and so you, you can <laughs> spend another 45 minutes and, and listen through it again. I'll tell you what, we'll, why don't we sign off? Um, we'll, we'll stay on line here for another five minutes or so in case anybody wants to, to linger. Uh, I, again, you know, if you don't feel like putting your comments up for everybody to see, feel free to like, fill out the survey, call me directly anytime, you can send me an email, um, you know, whatever works for you. Any feedback, any comments are absolutely welcome. And, and thanks again to everybody for, tu for tuning in, and uh, go Jays. John, your question is by installments. Uh, I don't think we can do that with uh, any of our fees. We're just not set up to be able to do that. Although, it is certainly not a plug for the CSRT. I know that they have an installment program that uh, we accept. So that, I think that's an option for you if you want to talk to the CSRT. If they allow you to, to break it out. Thanks, Rhonda. Yeah, that's absolutely what we're seeing. Um, you know, it was interesting doing the doing the prep for this. This, this is new for us, right? We've never had to increase. Uh, we wanted to see what's um, you know, what's what's the norm out there. What do, what do other colleges do? How do they approach it? And there's there's a range. You know, some some make it for standard increases every every handful of years. You know, we may end up there in years ahead, but uh, it would be nice not to have to you know, raise fees again for for some time. Um, but yeah, that, that costs go up, right? So everybody, everybody sort of budgets for it. Some are more uh, proactive. And, you know, that's not the right word. But some, some are more aggressive in terms of putting those in so it's an annual, whether they need it or not. Um, we try to do it only because we have to. OK, well, thanks, everybody. That's a wrap. Bye.